Um, right I'm on. Matthew Kretschmann. I'm coming to you from our All Saints camp in um, actually Northwest. So I'm a 4-H educator and I cover Allegheny County. And um, I also work for Penn State Extension. So uh, it's great to be here. And I'll let um, turn this back over. So it looks like the PowerPoint's ready to go. So. All right. Thanks, Matt. Um, I'm Denise Continenza, and I'm an extension educator based in Lehigh County. Um, half of my job is direct teaching of programs related to uh, families, children, and youth. And the other half of my job is coordinating Prosper and Communities That Care Coalitions. So um, Matt and I put this presentation together today based on input from folks who attended last year's a statewide meeting and said they really enjoyed the segment on youth mental wellness. So we are going to kind of like spring off there and, and move forward um, with uh, this presentation. I'm also one of those people that has been around with Prosper since it began um, back in 2002 or one, whatever. It was like my first day on the job, basically. And boy, I still remember some of those statewide conferences when we had to come in, in costume and we had some get-ups. The highlight of my entire career has been Janet dressed as a cheerleader. I mean, that was that was the year, um, I think Penn State football was our theme. That was um, that was quite an experience, I must say. So <laughs> we had some good times. So hope maybe we'll bring those back one day. So what we want to do today is talk about how adults can work to increase resilience in the lives of the young people with whom we interact, whether it's in our families, in our, our work, um, teaching, 4-H clubs, you know, whatever. Uh, we want to learn some skills that help young people feel listened to and respected when they're communicating their need for support to the adults in their lives. And hopefully we walk away here with some skills in our toolbox for working with youth um, during tough times, but really during all times. Um, yeah, as adults, we want to help. We always want to help young people through their difficult times. Um, and sometimes, you know, there are skills that we could add to that toolbox to make us even more effective in that role. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Matt. We have a little activity. Thank you. So I like to call this our meaningful connection time, um, which I can't get ice cream out of my head from this morning. Everybody's like put all those ice cream things in, <laughs> but we're going to do a little mean, meaningful connection together right now in this space where we are right now, depending upon if you're in an office, if you're at home. Uh, like I said, I'm at, I'm at camp right now. It's about a thousand degrees up here. There's just, there's no air conditioning, but, uh, but it's great. I love it. So, um, so take a minute. So you have about two minutes right now to go in the space that you're in and get up and find an item that represents resilience. <laughs> okay. Is that okay? Yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. Yeah, so absolutely. I a picture of my family. Um, and I was sharing with the group that there are my resilience. They are supportive when um, there's a challenge, if it's not through text message, a call um, or anything. So they, they are my main supporters and Super. they, you know, my resilience. <laughs> awesome. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. I appreciate that. Anybody else want to share? I'll share. So I go back to my faith, uh, particularly when things get difficult in life, um, is what I shared with the other group on the other screen, because um, sometimes life deals us some really hard blows, and sometimes this is what we need to do, is just uh, fall back on something that gives us strength. Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much Absolutely. for sharing. Great name, Matthew. Great name. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Looks like I may have had it first, though. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Copycat. <laughs> that was actually mine, dad. too. So, <laughs> how about one more? So, um, I chose a rubber band because you can pull it in all different directions and relating back to all of our teens and, you know, young adults and everything that we work with they 
quite often as well get pulled in multiple different directions and sometimes they don't know what to do but sometimes it's just nice to remind them that you can always snap back and go back to your original form and work right from the beginning again. That is such a wonderful object lesson, Haley. And this was not a plant because what <laughs> I, I told Haley, I said she was in my small group, and I said that's one of the the um, objects I use in workshops on resilience, especially with adults who work with young people. That um, you know, resilience is like a rubber band. We get pulled in many directions, sometimes stretched. You know, we think we're at the breaking point, and then you let go a little bit, and it starts to go back to its natural shape. And that is like the, you know, the, the living example of resilience. And our job as adults is to help young people build resilience and also building our own resilience as we go, because we know life can be tough. So thank you all so much for sharing with each other and then with the larger group. So Matt, I'll let you take over. Thank you. Excellent, President, like excellent everybody share and thank you so much. So. Um, since this is kind of our theme that's built on the last time I was with you, because um, I talked a little bit about youth mental health first aid, but um, sticking to our theme here about resilience, this is a study that came out of National 4-H that was done during COVID, um, where they surveyed over a thousand teens and, and all, all teens want everyone to take more action to reduce the stigma and around opening conversations around mental health, especially those who are resilient. So you can see some of these numbers here and I can, I'll share the study with everybody. If anybody's interested, we can, I can send that to Janet, to, to Janet, but I just thought it was really interesting how many youth are just, you know, want people to talk more openly about mental health issues and adults, even other youth, they want, they want to have those conversations. So creating that safe, brave space is something that, you know, we as professionals, we try to do. Um, and another thing too is, you know, as, as culture, as, as a culture, we should embrace both the ups and downs of mental health. And it's okay to feel bad sometimes. I thought that was so awesome that youth, like, you know, just seeing that, like, it's okay to, you know, just to be in that space and, and to know, like, it, like some of that, like, I just, I really, like some of this study was really interesting to me. Um, also, uh, was I, I, I wish more young people were more comfortable asking for help when it comes to their mental health. So, so just thinking about that and the power, like with this, just some of these numbers and us as professionals, I know all of you, Prosper team members or volunteers, whatever, you know, whatever space you're in, you know, we're all doing, doing work to, to help, um, you know, to help, to help these numbers um, and to, to build that resilience. Thanks, Denise. So just how, how big is the problem of mental health among young people? Um, this information was taken from the 2021 Pennsylvania Youth Survey. Um, and for those that aren't familiar with the survey, it is um, a tool that's administered to 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th graders every other year on the odd-numbered year, uh, about 90 questions where young people tell us how they feel, how they think, what they're doing and what they believe others think around many issues, including mental health and, and wellness. Um, and some of the data is, is pretty startling. So um, this is statewide data. So the number of youth across all grades that said they feel sad or depressed on most days it has increased steadily since 2017. So the pandemic notwithstanding, you know, we're still seeing rates of sadness and depression going up. Um, almost 44% of high school seniors said they're sad or depressed on most days. That's almost half of our high school seniors feeling sad most of the time. Um, and the, the rate of youth who said they were so sad that they stopped doing their usual activities increased across the board again from 2017 to 2021. Um, it, you know, yes, the pandemic had something to do with it, but even so, we had young people say, whoopsie, I'm sorry, I swirled the wrong thing. Um, they said that they were feeling more and more sad. Um, the rate of sixth graders, and this is, you know, when you think sixth grade, 10, 11, 12 year olds who planned so, to die by suicide rose from 6.8% to 9.9%. So we're talking the period 2017 to 2021. So if you want more information on the PAYS, 
the link is there. You can also just Google PA Youth Survey and it will come up. And there's reports there for each county. I believe each county has a report because um, if you have two school districts in your county that administer the pays, you get a uh, county report. Uh, county reports and state reports are available to the public. You can find out school district data by working with your school district. Um, but th this is a very telling report of how the youth in our community um, feel and how it's like a barometer for how they're doing mental health wise. So we know a lot about the, the teenage brain. Um, we know that the brain is not fully developed in teenagers and research is saying now that, you know, we used to say 23, 25. Now they're saying that the brain is not fully developed until 30, which scares me because I have a 26 year old. Um, but the front part of the brain that's responsible for judgment is the last part to develop. And that, that's kind of um, kind of scary because they take on adult roles and adult responsibilities. So our job as adults is to kind of act as the that prefrontal cortex or the, you know, the, the um, chief executive officer of the teen's brain while it's still developing. Um, teens tend to process information from the heart rather than the head. So they often act upon emotions or feelings rather than rational because remember that part of the brain is still not fully developed. Um, teens live in the here and now. So uh, what's happening right now is the way life is always gonna be. And one of the reasons we saw so much mental health crisis during the pandemic was for young people that don't have that thinking part of the brain fully developed yet. This was gonna be life from here on in. We were never going back to school ever again. I'm never gonna see my friends again because they have, the brain doesn't work that way yet in teens. Now we know there's a lot of variation in that. Environment plays a big part. Um, depending on what young people heard the adults around them saying impacts that. But young people just don't have the experience yet, the life experiences that we've had as adults to know that life does go on. Um, we've learned to develop our own resiliency to bounce back. Young people, children, teens are still learning that. There's probably a lot of adults that are still learning that as well but they don't have the track record that we've had. So um, yeah, when something bad happens, you know, this morning, I think everything went wrong from the time I got out of bed. And you know, as I was driving in, I, I said to myself, you know, I remember someone saying to me one time, you know, the good part is today will never happen again. And I often, when I'm having a rotten day, I think of that, you know, because life has taught me that. But when you're 12, 13, 14, your brain doesn't work that way. So we as adults have to help them um, to develop those skills and to develop that thinking, slow them down. So they move from responding with the heart to responding with the head. Uh, Matt, do you wanna do this? Thank you. Um, yeah, I appreciate it, thanks. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me okay? Cause mm -hmm. I know my screen just glitched a little bit. You're good? Okay, You're good. perfect. So. So Denise and I were talking and we were thinking like, what could we, you know, what is one thing that we could kind of give you a little bit of a refresher of some of your youth mental health first aiders. And, and this is like one area that I feel like all of us have to practice every day, even as professionals or wherever we are, your family member or what, whatever uh, environment we're in. So listening and responding non-judgmentally. Um, because as adults, we've, we've experienced many of these situations and struggles and, and there that, that youth are going through, but we often rush to, to solve problems or put, put them into like our own perspective, catch ourselves, like we catch ourselves doing that. So I'm going to do this. Uh, I know we don't have a chat, but I guess we could, we could maybe, um, we could maybe just ask somebody to raise their hand or unmute themselves if they want to answer this, but I'm going to ask you um, some, some situations where uh, how you would respond in, in, in non-judgmentally, in, in a non-judgmental way. So, so what are some things we often say to young people when they tell us if people don't mention 
oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> what, what if, I'm sorry. What are some things we often say to young people when they tell us about a problem they're having? Does somebody want to be on mute and so what are some things we often say to young people when they and, and one thing we try we wanted to do is we want this to be an engaging space where we can practice and learn from each other also so matt are you talking about what we say as professionals or what yeah is as adults common, yeah what's commonly said that's sometimes not helpful right yeah, yeah. so you want to hear the not helpful things <laughs> They, they can say let's do yeah. both. Let's do oh, both. Let's go. Let's do non-helpful first. Let's do non-helpful first. Um, how about well, you shouldn't feel that way. You have your whole life ahead of you. Mm -hmm. yeah. How about get over what it? What problems do you have? You don't have to pay taxes. Mm -hmm. yeah. get, or over get over it, I heard too. Yeah. Or wait till you get, get over. Get over. It. <laughs> Then you're oh, really just, problems. I need to step out for five minutes. I'll be right back. Sure. <laughs> yeah. You, when I was wait, your wait till you grow up. <laughs> then, you'll have, then you'll have real problems. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm classic so cool. for, um, uh, when I was your age, it, and then I, I, I all of a sudden take it off, the focus off the, the, the child or the young person, and it's all about me. I have to really be careful with that. I also think I, I have to stop myself from jumping into fixing, right? Oh, you should do this, or you could do that, or you, you know, as opposed to just what you're saying, Matt, which is listening. Yeah, absolutely. I usually restate what the child says to me. So what I'm hearing you say, awesome. this, 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 and this. So then what, now that you're hearing it from me, what? what's coming to your mind now as awesome. far as where you are in this space That's as excellent. a positive mm -hmm. i think even saying something as simple as you sound really sad which sounds so obvious opens up the door for them to continue right. speaking because you're identifying the feeling and you're giving them an opportunity and a space to process that feeling. So I think any type of empathy is always welcome. And sometimes just a, uh-huh, or, you know, tell me more. If you already have a relationship, you can say, tell me more. Um, yeah. Gives them the opportunity to talk about and, and try and figure it out because they, they might not even have a, a way to identify why they're feeling sad or what, is causing all that sadness, especially if there's several factors in their lives, issues at home, bullying at school, whatever it may be, so many challenges. So just to have someone help them um, unfold it and say, oh, right. it's this and it's this and, and you don't have to fix all of that at once and you don't have to figure out all of that at once. And um, I think it's so common for us as professionals to feel like we have to help Fix, but that's not what helps the person we're attempting to help the most. What helps them is their ability to realize they can help themselves. And there, and that is building resilience right there. Helping Absolutely. people see that it's it's empowering. Mm -hmm. um, so, and sometimes this stuff is so e so much easier on a professional level. And then mm -hmm. going home to your own mm -hmm. children, thinking, oh yeah, I still have to be that adult. Yeah. Haley, were you going to share something? I was just going to say that I think that sometimes it is nice to remember that we don't always have to fill up space. So uh, let there be silence sometimes because sometimes we just need a little bit of time to process even what they want to say. So yeah, that was all. <laughs> no, that's, that's so, Excellent. so important to let that after somebody says something and then perhaps you've reflected it back to them. And then they hear what they just said and they're thinking, wow, is it really that bad? Or is that what I'm really thinking and feeling? So it gives them time to reflect. Silence, it's tough. It is really tough to Absolutely. let that let me sit. Yeah. I agree. Way. Even from you know, running hybrid programming now and in the virtual space, like mm -hmm. silence can be so scary. 
And I could just imagine some of you as professionals doing, you know, the uh, telepsych or, or, or anything. I'm like, oh my gosh, like silence. Like, how do you use it? Like, so many things go through your brain, but all excellent, excellent. Uh, thank you so much for, for commenting and, and uh, you know, providing some feedback. This is great. Um, so, Denise, if you want to go, do you want to go to the next slide? We yeah, can... Absolutely. Thank you. So, so we were talking about, I know some of us say, uh, you know, what makes a good listener? So I heard some, uh, you know, some, some of you talking about some of those nonverbal and verbal cues. I just thought like we could, you know, just share some of the things, maybe, maybe uh, that you've, something you've, you've learned new about what, what makes a, what makes a good listener. Um, and it could be in this space uh, right now. Um, I have recently learned that sometimes your body language can be a really good indicator mm -hmm. about whether they feel like you are listening to them or not. So sometimes just being nice and open with your posture and making them know that you are present and not always keeping eye contact. Make sure there is a break sometimes. So, you know, you don't make them a little bit too nervous or anything. Excellent. Yes, thank you. And also just, you know, kind of thinking about culturally too, one of the things that depending upon who we're working with, like you mentioned eye contact. I never knew one culture, like they just don't, there, there are times they do not make eye contact with you and you, you think they're not listening, but they really are. They're really listening, but that's, 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 uh, thanks for sharing that. Anybody else like to share like something they might've learned new about um, you know, being a good listener? Um, like summarizing think, what is being said. So just kind of restating, um, you know, if they're talking to you about their feelings, just kind of summarizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're showing that you're trying to understand them. Let me say if I understand. So what you're telling me is, and you're, you're showing that you're really attempting to understand where what they're feeling, where they're coming from. And you're paying attention. I think it goes a long way to turn your phone off and put it down or really close your laptop. Like, my phone. <laughs> Enjoy. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Remove distractions. Making sure that you're in a good place to be the listener at that point when a young person comes yeah. to talk to you. Doing a you know quick check. You know, do I have it? And and sometimes you know we have to maybe start the conversation and say, I want to talk with you more about this. When can we get together? Again, you know, get the follow up because you don't want to want the person to feel like they're being brushed off. Absolutely. Some of the best conversations I've had with kids was like either on a walk or in the car, where mm -hmm. they're sort of like, you know they're they're with you, but you're more shoulder to shoulder instead of face to face, and people really talk, especially in a car. I don't know what it, what it is about that, but it really, um, you know, it, it, it takes some of that direct focus off. But yet they feel your, your presence. Anything Thanks, else? Denise. I would say also listening to a specific words. Um, sometimes they can say, yes, I have been disappointed by this and this and that. And the conversation kind of started asking what makes you feel disappointed? What is the reason? Um, I think that being careful with uh, starting with a why, because it's very intimidating for the kids and they, they close, they get close. I, I have experiences with that. I personally, I don't like that people come to me and say, why you didn't do this? Mm -hmm. It's a very intimidating. So what they may be is lying or hiding more information. Excellent, excellent. So tell me, tell me more about, tell me more about that. It's, yeah, how does how does that make you feel disappointed? What about that? Rather than just saying why, it's more open ended questions instead yeah. of those that are more closed. Absolutely. I also think your point, Denise, <clears throat> like riding in the car kind of thing. I think that for kids just to like sit and have a conversation and not you know can feel very yeah. awkward and forced. I I've had some of my best conversations with kids about. <laughs> tough things while we were um, shooting baskets or 
hitting golf balls or you know doing some other activity other than just sitting there talking. Yeah, that's absolutely. Is that was that Janet? Yeah. I'm yeah. sorry, I couldn't hear. Was that you? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Like changing that environment, I think definitely helps. Like having youth here at camp, they're way more to open up. And some of like the camp talk that happens in the cabins, you're like, whoa, like hold on. But but when you change that environment up, absolutely. So with young with uh, with adults, we may be more inclined to want to sit down and have a conversation and put some time aside to meet one on one and sit with young people. We might want to have a more casual environment and set it up so that they have our presence, but we're not, you know, zeroing in right on them. Um, some of the things youth tell us um, may seem trivial to us because we've been there, we've done it, we've gone through it, we know life goes on. But keeping in mind that with young people living in the here and now, um, a, a breakup, not being invited to a party, um, a friend ignoring them, all those things are just huge monumental issues. So we wanna stay focused on the feeling and then helping the person, the young person, make choices. How are, so, so what are you going to do about it? What are some options? You know, let, and help them to build their resilience. And the next time they go through that, now they have a frame of reference and they will probably need our help with, so what did you do about last time? Yeah, didn't that happen you know, a couple months ago with your other friend? What did you do then? I wonder if that would work again. So we're helping them to um, use, to build that judgment part of the brain. Maybe they really wanted to go and punch that person out, but we're going to help them to see that that is probably not the best choice. There's other things that could be more effective. So our job is to help them think through those options and choices. Anything else about what makes someone a good listener? I, I just want to share something. Yeah. Um, I think what's really important about being a good listener is listening to what's not said as much mm -hmm. as what is said. And if you Absolutely. are trying to help that young person identify that feeling, I mean, if they can identify it, that's wonderful. Then you have something to um, work with or help them with because you have a starting point. But if they can identify it and you say, it sounds like you're feeling fill in the blank, angry, disappointed, mm -hmm. frustrated. I think the other thing that's important to recognize is young people will tell you, <laughs> even if they're really sad, no, I'm not feeling like that, or no, it's not that, or uh-uh. Like, I think they would let you know what it isn't for you to help you both discover more of what it is. Yeah. Great. Why do, why do you think young people do that? And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not mad. Yeah, and you can just see the flames coming I'm not out of there. Mad. <laughs> yeah. Why, why do the young people do that? So maybe it's the brain, you know, we just talked about that developmental part and emotionally too. I mean, when I think of the young people that I've worked with, sometimes I'm amazed that they have gotten out of bed that morning with everything they had to deal with and made it to school. So I think sometimes we have to remember, I, I mean, we talked about it's a breakup. If you've ever been through a breakup, it's reminding ourselves of what we've been through because everybody has a right to their feelings. Feelings aren't right or wrong. So everybody, I think, deserves a safe place to express that feeling or explore it with someone who's earned the trust to hear it. Yeah. Awesome. And that is the reason, and that is the reason because they feel that we are going to judge their feelings. Mm -hmm. Oh, you are not supposed to feel that way. Oh, forget about it about the breakup. There is more fishes in the sea. You know, so <laughs> I think what we're looking at it, it, in a nutshell is the word validation. Mm -hmm. We want to validate what the child the, is going through or what their emotions are that are attached with the situation. And they're just looking for that validation, just like any of us at any age is looking for that validation. Absolutely. You, as we say in mental health first aid training, you don't have to agree with the person. You don't have to, um, you know, come to some sort of consensus. You just have to validate and um, accept that this is where 
that young person, and this goes for adults too, accepting where they're at, trying to understand what they're feeling and help them to move forward. You don't have to necessarily agree or embrace their, their value. But we want to show um, our nonverbals as well as our verbals, uh, show acceptance. Great. great. I, I think you, you guys have all had such great, great contributions today. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, just so, um, uh, Matt, and this and I think of too. like intent in, in, and also like one thing I think of like, you know, just being intentional with you, you know, the, the level of intentionality that we, you know, that we give in that space when, when working with anyone. Um, but a couple of tips and some of you might have seen these before in, in, uh, in the mental health first aid uh as a first aider so some of the things that that we want to we want to remember to use is use i statements um and and don't interrupt the youth uh also you know it's often we want to talk about ourselves or that experience that we had when that youth you know that was whatever it was so it's not about you it's about that you know about what they're you know they're saying and and just you know not minimizing that that situation that they might be experiencing because we often, you know, we all, we, we all feel differently. Um, ask questions and don't be pushy. You know, thinking about like, you know, non-judgmental judgment, listening. Um, another, another thing too would be, you okay. know, just culture definitely plays a role. And that's one thing um, that we always have to, to, to recognize and, and, and think about. So thanks, Denise. I should probably ask, does anybody have any questions or, yeah. or comments that they wanted to share? I know we didn't really, we've been kind of moving through. Uh, I hope I don't speak too fast. I'm sorry. Sometimes I get excited. So any questions, comments? Can you give an example of how to ask questions without being push, too pushy? That's a, that's a great question. I think it's very situational, um, uh, depending upon um, what you know what that might what that situation might look like. Uh, if someone else wants to take a you know to like you know take a stab at this too with me, um, I really you know I think it's more situational and and depending upon like just looking at those nonverbal and verbal cues from that youth. And, and, and even that level of uh, the trust that you might have um, up, up with them. And even an adult, this works the same way. So um, yeah, I would, I would just recommend, anybody want to comment? I was going to recommend like open-ended questions. Like, so, so tell, tell me more about that rather than saying, um, and then, um, you know, putting, putting words in the, in the youth's mouth, like, and then he did this to you, right? Or then he, yeah, that rather he said, tell me more about that. Yeah, I'm curious. Yeah, so that the open-ended questions are, are yeah, that way the, the person can choose what to say and what not to. It's not and, yes or and, no. And maybe you start it. Yeah, Denise, I agree. And, and maybe you would start with um, just an observation and say, wow, you know, it seems like you're kind of upset today. I'm wondering I'm with you, right? And just sort of open the door and see what they say, right? That That might be... And, and, you know, to say upset or um, not yourself or, you know, something where you're not labeling the feeling because you're not right. there, right? Um, and then you just invite them to do that if, if they want to. I, I think something like um, your tone too, um, because we need to be aware of our tone so that we're not trying to be too inquisitive. So if we say something like, gee, it, it, sounds like you really really are so angry at him or her is that right by us saying is that right we're giving them the option to tell us more without us trying to guess or pinpoint it which gets gets us into fixing i think if we're at least i know it does for me if i'm not aware of that so i think sometimes just saying is that right or is that what you mean like, and, and coming from that standpoint of really trying to understand what they are feeling, which goes back to, it's not about us. Like, it's not a reflection on us if we don't have a really good conversation with someone. We'll get another chance, most likely. Um, so it's just being 
present and asking that, is this what you mean or is that right? Or did I understand you correctly? Because then we're putting it back on our ability to understand them instead of having them get more frustrated because the conversation can get confusing. That's my view on how to maybe ask a question without being pushy. And sometimes uh, people in general just don't want to talk anymore. And young people, especially, the, the, the level of trust is just a little different. They, they have, you know, young people, teenagers are very concerned about what people think about them. So they might be less willing than an adult to say, yeah, I'm, I'm really ticked off because of, you know, whatever happened. Um, they might put that that facade or that mask on and not really divulge their feelings but the fact that you've inquired you seem really sad today you seem out of sorts um the, it's saying to them you care enough to come and ask to show concern so it might take a couple contacts or conversations before a young person really starts talking but we want to open that door and open it gently does that help Yeah. I mean, I think that is a process until you don't know a little bit about that person itself. Right. You need to know um, the personality um, because sometimes we get pushy just saying you need to share that because otherwise it's going to to stay in your in, in your life for, for, for a while and you are going to be that mad. So sometimes we, we start talking like that. But I think it's to learn a little bit more about who the person is and as Denise mentioned definitely teenagers sometimes they don't want to talk at that moment mm -hmm. and it's just to be letting them know that's fine I understand that you seems that you are a little bit uh, uh, upset so just let me know when you're ready right I awesome. don't know something yeah. like that no you're right you're <laughs> right on right on track and you're right it depends on the relationship you have with uh, that young person uh, as a parent, as a coach, as a 4-H leader, as a teacher, it's all going to be different. So you have to really take that into consideration. Uh, sometimes I think this stuff is harder to do at home than it is in the, the workplace or the volunteer realm. And it's harder that, you know, the closer the relationship. I don't know if we have time to get into small groups and practice. What do you think, Matt? Do you want to just do like one scenario? I don't think so either. I was just going to suggest that we we could just give the um we could give the scenarios and practice here together right. since we're having such a great conversation. Yeah, I love where everyone's like unmuting is... and jumping in. I mean, this is you never know. Yeah, you never know how it's going to go. But thank you guys so much. And if it sounds like we're doing a, a commercial for mental health first aid, we are. Um, mental health <laughs> first. Aid, a lot of this material was taken from there. Um, it is an absolutely wonderful training to increase your comfort level in recognizing and responding to early mental health, potential early mental health conditions in um, young people and, you know, in adults. So um, on the last slide is both Matt's and my contact information. If you would be interested in attending a training or if your organization would like a training. Matt and I are both certified instructors. Um, so, you know, we'd love to, you know, to hear from you. But um, that's the end of the commercial. So back to the, the practice. Great commercial, thank you. So, um, <laughs> So thinking about uh, this is a scenario that we were gonna we we're gonna kind of do breakout rooms, but we're all here in this um, together, so this is great. Um, so your daughter comes home crying because her boyfriend broke up with her, and she feels like her life is ruined forever. So how would you respond non-judgmentally? So we were gonna do listening too, but like we're just gonna stick to the non-judgmental. <laughs> Oh, Haley, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yep, there you okay. go. I think I would probably approach her and ask her if she needs any comfort or any, like a hug or anything like that, just to kind of calm the situation right at the beginning a little bit so that maybe she can start thinking a little bit clearer. Okay. Great, so because of your relationship with her, you would, you, know, you might reach out and give her a hug. 
You might yes, but I definitely with- ask for permission yeah. though, because mm-hmm. you know, sometimes when you're in that moment, it is a little bit hard to accept any kind of physical touch or anything. So excellent. Well, if I could just say, I think I would be happy that my daughter came home and told me um, so many times they don't want to share those type of experiences with us. Um, I'm sure there's many on this call that have gone through experiences like that. And sometimes we don't want to share it because we're hurt. And who wants to share hurt? Um, so in the case of that was my daughter, and maybe it was my daughter. My daughter's 35 now. She probably did. And, and I'm thinking back <laughs> that, you know, it was either me and my wife who, you know, just said, you know, everything will be okay. You know, um, reassuring these are, these are the things that go on in life. Um, you know, and, and tell her she has a whole life ahead of her. But like I say, I think I would be just more happy that she shared it with us than anything else. Cause then, then more than likely she is looking for that hug. I hear what the person just said, cause she's looking for that. Then she's looking for some comfort from her parents. And what a great way to validate that. The, I'm just, just by saying, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you felt comfortable enough to come and share this with us. Cause that says, wow, I can, come and talk to them about other stuff. So you're validating that, great. And reassuring her without making, without trivializing the breakup that you know, you're saying, it's okay, you're gonna be okay. Great. Yes, I had experience with my daughter. So um, she was crying and, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's very hurtful when you see your daughter crying for, you know, about that. And you have the tendency to blame the other part, not your daughter. So um, that was my reaction. (laughs) But at the same time, at the same time, I try to be empathetic with her, although it's very important to say, oh, I understand how you feel. No, they're going to tell you, no, mom, you don't know how do I feel. So we need to be careful with those words, because sometimes definitely we do not know. We can maybe um, um, share experiences that we had in the past that are similar to the ones that they are facing at that moment, but definitely is not the same. So yes, I hug her. And then I told her, when you are ready, if you want to talk more, so I am here to to talk with, with you. Awesome. You're right. Don't trivialize it. And don't make it yours because it's their it's their moment, it's their time, you know. And the last thing is, don't call the other person a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get back together, and then you'll be the bad guy. Because right? it is my daughter. <laughs> you didn't drive over to his house, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a country and western song, house. isn't it? Where you shine your lights in their window. <laughs> <laughs> no you don't do that that's, oh, that's funny. Yeah, <laughs> how about one more any other more response to this scenario hi it's carol um hi, sometimes you know when i when my children come to me with certain issues and things like that um and i hear what they're saying sometimes i i say to them well, what do you think the other person is feeling or what's their thoughts and how do you think that has changed the situation or can fix the situation? You know, although, you know, we want to listen to them, but sometimes we know there is one side of the story, another side of the story, and then the truth in the whole story. And again, and I'm not saying I don't believe my children. I, I totally do. And, and I don't want to belittle their feelings, but you know, yes, validate that they, you know, that they have these feelings that, you know, it is valid. Um, We need to work on that, but looking at the whole picture and and seeing sometimes maybe it could work out. That's kind of just what I do sometimes. Excellent, thank you so much for sharing. Um, Denise, I'm looking at time. We're probably gonna have to move. Yeah. We're gonna move to our yeah, next real quickly. slide here. So, so these are some and skills I'll, that so we I'm can. Time. Yeah, if you want to get to go through that, some skills that we can share with young people so they can help each other as well. Yeah, absolutely. And this is this is something that we're we've been exploring in 4-H, and um, one thing we're just trying to like 
we want to empower our youth to act. So, so when somebody is, you know, in that, you know, if, if a youth is off to the side crying or something, you know, something's happening here at camp, we, we have this, um, and we were looking for something that was a little bit simpler than algae to, to teach youth, you know, ask and ask care and tell is, is one of the, uh, the tools that we, we have found. And, and the ask part is when, when they, observe a, a red flag in in a friend's life so that's that that is that ask piece so if you see something you go over and, and you engage them so it's that care is the next part of that process and it's 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 a non-linear a non-linear thing so um about friends by you know what you do is you like you care about your friend by responding without judgment and in support uh, that the friend is is in it in this is is like in the safe space with you to you know, disclose maybe what that, you know, what's going on. Um, and then at that point, uh, it's that tell. So it could be, it could be maybe uh, um, an unsafe secret that they shared with you. It could be just, maybe they just needed to talk to you. But, um, but in that, then there, there's the, the tell. So, so which is, which is one of the most important parts where the teen understands that, that they must be in involved with a trusted adult to to accompany accompany that friend so so you know the most important part of the lesson is the teen to to, to be able to tell like and they, and they can accompany talk with another adult so um this is just something that we you know we're exploring right now we thought it would be a great tool for for uh to share with everybody um and uh kind of concludes our our presentation but we can up to our next slide here. Anybody have any questions? How would you respond if you are working with a child and we are all mandated reporters? Are there any scenarios that you can give as examples as to if something is divulged, what some a possible responses would be that would be to you guys as well as everybody else on, on the talk? I, I think you know, if a child divulges something to us that's, that raises a flag for us and we think they're in, you know, in danger, they've been abused in some way, um, we have to say to the, the young person, I, you know, I, I'm, I appreciate that you came and shared this with me, but this is something that I need to share with someone else in order to keep you safe. Uh, you know, letting them know that you, you, you are required to take it one step further for their safety and benefit. Matt, if you don't want to, if anybody else wants to add anything to oh, that, yeah. please we, do. We often, um, when we conduct workshops or any, in, in during camp here, it's one thing that, you know, very open to, to the youth to say, you know, there are certain things that, you know, that I can't, like I can't keep it. And so like there are certain things I can't, I have to like, so the mandated reporter piece, um, but just being as transparent as possible with the, you know, with the youth knowing that um, it, it, it does, it does continue to, it does build trust because, but, but also, um, I mean, it's just, it's very situational, I, I feel, but, um, but definitely I think, you know, one thing, if you question, if you question it, you always report. I mean, there's just, I mean, if you have to think think about it it's you know we just that's kind of our practice but. and I think Denise's point about making sure that the young person understands that you're not just betraying their trust right it it's it's that this is for their safety I I do think that's a very important piece to always put in there you know that I'm going to need to talk to um, somebody about this because we want to make sure that you're safe that kind of And if there are no other questions, yeah. that takes us to the full hour. And I, we, have, Matt, and I both would appreciate your participation. This was a great, great interactive discussion. There's our contact information if you have any further questions. Thank you. Well, I can get started without a PowerPoint. And, um, you know, I just, we just wanted to start off by saying thank you. 
really thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Everyone here from Prosper, everyone here from other organizations working all across Pennsylvania to support youth and families every single day, everything you do with Youth Matters. And so we just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that and thank you for all everything you do to support youth. Um, I think, let's see. So I'm just going to kind of keep going and I can share this. I can share whenever. I mean, I don't have too much to say, but um, <laughs> Sarah, you now have the power. <laughs> do I? I have the power. Yes. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, I did have some fun animation actually. So let me go back to that first slide. Okay. Um, see, isn't that just great animation? <laughs> anyway, so no, seriously, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Everything you do with Youth Every Day Matters. Um, and so I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge that. Um, just a bit of reflection here. Over the last 20 years, we started with seven school districts, Prosper in seven school districts. We are currently working with 18. Hopefully I counted right. You know, over the years then we've had a few other districts kind of come and go and kind of try out Prosper for a little bit and um, kind of ebb and flow back with participation. And it's been great. We've learned a lot and um, and we've enjoyed working with everyone. Um, you know, we'd still love to grow. So if you're interested in bringing Prosper to your community, just give a reach out to Janet or, or Danny Perkins or myself or Melissa, or really any your extension in your community. Um, and we can start conversations. Um, I just wanted to do just a, a bit of future directions, kind of where we're looking. Um, obviously or somewhat obviously with last year's presentation and this year again with Denise and Matt, um, Extension is moving in the direction that they're doing a lot with mental health first aid these days and doing a lot of courses. And oftentimes they're virtual, sometimes they are in person. Um, either way, it means they're highly accessible for you and others in your community. I'd encourage you to check that out. I also wanted to mention that, you know, Prosper is listening. And in the last few years, we've observed and we've heard that the mental health is just as equally a concern as substance use and preventing substance use. And so as a team, we are also um, within the Prosper group, trying to build capacity to, to do some mental health first aid implementation kind of um, to, to even bring that more to Pennsylvania. And so we have a couple of grants in, hopefully they're funded and, um, and we'll be able to do even more related to that in Pennsylvania. Um, let's see, we've also, you know, as we've grown over the years, we've tried out integrating a few different things like drug take back efforts in with our universal prevention programming. Uh, we've also really started using those PA start materials. Those are great resources that were put together at the state level. Thank you so much for those. And, um, but still our foundation is the family program and the school program. Uh, definitely we're, we're becoming more flexible and adaptable and, you know, there are changes and um, things exist in the world today that we didn't imagine 20 years ago. And so we're rolling with those punches, but there's still that strong foundation, the family program, the school program, and that kind of crucial developmental period of early adolescence and transitions to middle school um, is still our strong foundation. And so then I just wanted to share that Prosper, we have, um, a new and improved website. I don't remember exactly when it was introduced. Maybe we shared it with you a little bit last year. I don't know if I'm going to be able to share it today. Looks like I can. So, um, so I'd encourage you to come check us out. And, you know, with those, the opioid settlement money coming out, um, we do have connections to opioid use prevention. And so 
we have just the link mm -hmm. to some more information about um, reducing opioid use. And so these are fact sheets specific to Prosper, but you might also find them to be helpful more generally in your community about prevention and promoting the use of evidence-based prevention in your communities. Let's see. And then I think I wanted to close with uh, just a little bit more thanks. And so um, we're keeping it a little bit more small and narrow this year. And out of those folks here on the call, we did want to acknowledge those that have given uh, many years to prosper. And so Mindy, Janet, and Denise, um, your folks in the communities that have given 20 years to prosper, thank you so much. But then we still have a good group that's done 10 years or more, Pete, Rob, Mahali, Christy, five years or more, Kelly, Caroline, Michelle, Patricia, Teresa, Kara, and Jean. And then we also, you know, we can't prosper without, um, we need those, that stability and that strength and that tradition, but we also need new, new ideas and new people and, and to bring new folks into pre prevention for Pennsylvania and promoting positive youth development. And so, so we do have some newer folks on the call today or on this meeting today, and we appreciate you as well, Melissa, Beth, Cindy, Michelle, Amanda, Cammie, John, Lee, and Carol. Hopefully I got everybody. If I didn't, I have deepest apologies. And um, and then of course, to kind of wrap up back where I started, um, it's not just about Prosper, but everything everyone here does in their communities matters. And so thank you for everything you do. Thanks for spending the morning with us. And I'll kick it back to Janet. Thanks, Sarah. That was great. Um, and just to anybody who got forgotten from that list, we can't ever quite seem to get that list right. So um, if you were supposed to be on it, but you're not, we uh, we love you anyway, right? Um, and thank you for your involvement with Prosper um, and for prevention everywhere in Pennsylvania. Um, we're gonna transition now to Terry and Ryan from the Clearinghouse for Military Family Readiness here at Penn State. I'm gonna give you a little bit of, of background as to why they're mixed up with us here in Prosper. Um, as they will explain, um, the, the Clearinghouse provides uh, resources and services primarily for the military population, is funded by the different service branches in the DOD. One thing that they're very good at is remote outreach, right? So the military population is very mobile, um, and so they need to constantly be thinking, how can we reach out to families that are constantly moving and located all around the world. Um, this became an issue for us, right? It, with Prosper, with everything during the pandemic, uh, how do we reach people beyond our usual ways? So uh, that was that was one reason why we reached out to them and say and said, gee, you know, you guys have expertise in this in this distance outreach kind of stuff. Uh, could you help us? The the other thing is, you know, as as I said uh, at the beginning. We try have tried for a long time in Prosper to respond to issues from the field. So when you guys come to us and say, this is what we're dealing with, like youth mental health you know, issues, we try to find a resource for that. Um, one of the things that's, that happened over the course of the last decade uh, as, as communities were really struggling in, in the opioid addiction space is that families were showing up to uh, SFP 1014 with grandparents uh, being in custodial caregivers for their grandchildren and, and participating in SFP. The sense that we got from the field is that, that this is, uh, you know, SFP was good for them, but that they might benefit from additional resources as well. And so we uh, got in touch with the, the folks at the clearinghouse around developing some modules for specifically for grandparents um, that, that could be accessed remotely. 
uh, which was obviously very important for that grandparent population during during COVID, um, that would could be supplemental to SFP 10 to 14. So um, that's a long way around of saying that um, we wanted to share that information with you, make sure those resources are available. Because they were developed with uh, SAMHSA funding, they are free to everyone. Um, and so we want everyone to be aware of that. And then also to hear a little bit more about just Thrive generally and uh, what's available, um, additional family resources in addition to everything else that we've provided historically for Prosper over the past 20 years. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ryan and Terry at the Clearinghouse for Military Family Readiness to tell us about Thrive. Um, so my name is Terry Rudy. I am the research project manager at the Clearinghouse for the Thrive Initiative. I've been at the Clearinghouse since 2012, um, and I primarily work on projects and programs um, centered around ch child and family well-being. So Ryan, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Chestnut. I am a assistant research professor at the Clearinghouse. Um, <clears throat> I've been uh, there since 2014, and um, <clears throat> I've been working on the Thrive Initiative uh, project uh, ever since my first day. Um, we've been working to develop and build and disseminate um, those programs. And so uh, my role largely centers around um, the evaluation side of uh, these programs, uh, but I also do some um, in terms of development and dissemination uh, as well. Thanks, Ryan. And Ryan, will you confirm for me what you're seeing? Are you just seeing this first slide? Uh, yep, I just see the, okay. yep. Okay, thanks, good. I don't see that typical green box here. Okay, so for those of you who might not be familiar with the Clearinghouse, I know Janet gave us a nice little intro there, um, but we are an applied research um, center here at Penn State, and we primarily provide support to professionals who offer programs and services directly to military families, and we are located in the Social Science Research Institute. So. We help professionals to identify, to implement, to evaluate, and also to improve programs that really help to strengthen military families, um, service members and their families actually. Um, so some of the projects that we work on are across all of the Department of Defense, so all service branches and some are service specific. So like Janet mentioned today, we wanna talk to you about a parent education program that we developed in collaboration with the Department of Defense, and that is called the Thrive Initiative. So our goals and objectives for today are to really just talk to you about Thrive and the programs and resources that are available so that you can share that information with families that you work with who might benefit from participation in any of the programming. And also to understand the process for how we developed the programs and to talk a little bit about that Grand Families Supplemental Module that we developed and how you access that module and then the other Thrive programs as well, the other online programs, and then also to review initial research findings. So if at any time anybody has any questions or comments, please feel free to share. Um, you do not have to wait or you can wait till the end if you would like to. So what is Thrive? The Thrive Initiative is a portfolio of evidence-informed, developmentally appropriate parent education programs that also include a health promotion component. So we have online and face-to-face -face universal parent education programming. We have secondary prevention programming. We have online resources available for parents and families. And then we also have resources available for professionals. And then in addition, the newest thing that we are developing are those online supplemental modules that are geared towards specific topic areas like the Grand Families Supplemental Module. The Thrive Universal Programming is available at no cost to military and civilian families and is directly available through the Thrive website at thrive.psu.edu. When we started to develop the programs, the military really wanted us to make sure that this programming was available to all families and not just specifically for military. So even though it's coming through a DOD funding source, it is available to everyone. 
Okay, so with the development of Thrive, the Department of Defense was initially looking for one universal program that ranged across the entire child lifespan. So from birth to 18 years of age. But with that range of developmental differences, you know, across that whole span, there was just too much going on for us to really put that into one comprehensive program. So what we decided to do was break it down into four separate developmentally appropriate parent education programs. So on the screen, you'll see the four Thrive Universal programs. We have Take Root. That is for parents and caregivers of children zero to three years old. Sprout for parents and caregivers of children three to five years old or the preschool age range. Grow for parents and caregivers of children five to 10 years old or that school age range. And then branch out for parents and caregivers of children 10 to 18 or that middle to high school age range. We began the development of Thrive in 2014. And we started with the GROW program because that was the greatest need at the time for our partners. Initially, we developed GROW in a face-to-face -face format, but soon after we adapted the programming for online delivery and getting back to what Janet mentioned earlier, really it was to help reduce the barriers to program access. And also because it was more cost effective, but you know, the military is highly mobile. They are, they are moving around, they're PCSing to new duty stations. We have installations that don't necessarily have the same resources as other installations. So we really wanted the program to be available to everyone and not just at specific or certain locations. Then in December of 2021, we completed the development of Branch Out. So that was the final program to be developed. So all in all, it took us about seven years to build and complete all four of these universal programs. In addition to the universal online programming under the Thrive umbrella, there are two targeted parenting programs that focus on child maltreatment prevention and high needs populations. And these are both face to face programs and they really grew out of our work with the universal programming with DOD. When we were piloting the grow face to face program, the installation we were working with said, hey, this program is really great, but we're talking to families about sitting down and enjoying a meal together when some of these families can't even find their kitchen table. Let's back it up a few steps and let's find something to help those families. So we're not going to go into too much detail here with these programs, but we did want to provide you with a full picture of the programming that's available across Thrive. The first secondary pre prevention program that we have is Take Root Home Visitation, and that's for families, parents, and caregivers who have young children in that zero to three um, age range. And those are families that are at risk for child maltreatment. Take Root Home Visitation um, uses a manualized curriculum as, and is delivered by home visitation specialists. Currently, we are working to pilot this program with the Navy and the Marine Corps. The second program we have, um, secondary prevention program we have is Grow Safe and Secure. And that is for families with school aged children. So that five to 10 age range, again, who are at risk for child maltreatment. This program will be delivered to parents. It'll be in a one-on-one -on -one format um, delivery by a clinician. And we're currently wrapping up the development of this program and plan to pilot the program next year with the Department of Defense. So this next slide here really just gives you a full picture of the programs that we have that fall underneath the umbrella of Thrive. We have the four universal programs, you know, available in online, Grow, which is also available in that face-to-face -face format, and then the two targeted programs that are available um, for those high needs populations. So I'm going to shift um, and let Ryan talk to you a little bit about the development of the programs and the process that we followed. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so when we uh, first started uh, the development of the Thrive Initiative uh, back in 2014, um, you know, honestly, we didn't really know what it was going to turn into uh, seven, eight years later, um, but we needed some sort of organizational framework, something to help us kind of think what is, what's the focus, what's the direction, what are kind of the the, the emphases, the foci that we want to have here. And so uh, in consultation with our DOD partners and in looking at the evidence base and the literature at the time, um, we kind of uh, centered on three sort of overarching learning objectives, which is what you're seeing uh, on the screen right now. Positive parenting practices, parent-child stress management, and 
this, this third one, strategies for promoting child physical health, that was, we started really focusing just on the child, um, but that has evolved over the years. And really, I think now is really more focused on family, uh, promoting family health, physical health. Um, and so within each one of these learning domains, so like positive parenting practices, for example, that's really encompassing the knowledge, attitudes, and skills that are shown to promote uh, child functioning at multiple developmental periods. So this would be, we'll talk, we'll see this, I think, a little bit later, but this would be things like praising encouragement, uh, things of that nature. Uh, parent and child stress management, that really emphasizes self-regulation. And I think that's something that as we have moved uh, over the years, I think that's something that our team has become uh, increasingly more and more aware of the importance of, of, of applying a self-regulatory approach in parent education programming. And then the physical health promotion was something that the DOD was very interested in. Um, and at the time when we started this, that was actually something we found to be really an underemphasized aspect of parenting programs. Um, there, there wasn't a lot of um, information or um, uh, literature evidence out there specifically focusing on the connection between health promotion and parenting programs, at least across multiple developmental periods. And so that was something that we really wanted to emphasize um, just to kind of have a holistic approach in how we were uh, coming at our Thrive programming. And then I think, Terry, if you want to go to the next slide. So after we kind of jumped over that hurdle of what is our kind of overarching framework, the next hurdle was um, program development. How do you, how, do, how are we going to go about developing these programs uh, for the military? And uh, as we were researching different program development strategies in the literature and looking at different things, we came across this uh, approach that at the time was still uh, relatively new um, and it was called the common components analysis. And um, like so many sort of, uh, I find social science methodologies, there were multiple people who were talking about this sort of approach, but they were calling it different things. Um, and so we kind of centered around uh, Bruce Chorpita's work uh, to kind of inform what we were doing, but there were many other scholars who were also in this and, and trying to figure out um, kind of how do you do this sort of well. And one of the central assumptions of a common component of the common components analysis approach is that evidence-based programs that are designed for a specific purpose. So in our case, parent education programs and a specific audience. So for example, with our GROW program, we'd be thinking about elementary aged kids, parents with elementary aged kids. Um, so these programs are more similar than dissimilar. And the features that they share in common may actually be some of the active ingredients that are responsible for the treatment effects. And so in this approach, there's sort of a four step process that we tried to undertake to help us kind of identify what's the content that we really wanna focus on in our various uh, parenting programs. And we've applied this approach to the development of all four of our universal uh, programs. And so the first thing that we do is we have to identify the programs that we're going to be looking at to try to uh, extract components from. Recognizing again that you know, one of our recognitions is we, we're not the first people to ever develop a parenting program. So um, what are the programs out there that are evidence-based and seem to work? And so uh, the Clearinghouse actually has um, an evidence-based program repository. Uh, we call it the Continuum of Evidence. And uh, it's actually a website that we have, and it's really a fantastic resource uh, where anybody can go. And I think we have over 1400 programs placed on that continuum uh, where we talk about the evidence base of those programs, implementation of those programs. Um, we produce fact sheets um, and it's, uh, it's searchable database. So you can look at it by topic area, if you're looking at parenting or substance use or all these different things. Um, I believe the web address is continuum.psu.edu. Um, I, I think that is correct. Um, and so we use that and we also use the uh, child, California evidence-based, uh, gosh, I'm blanking on the name now. I think it's the California Clearinghouse for uh, 
child evidence-based programming. I am almost confident I just butchered that, so I apologize. I don't think, <laughs> but we use both of those, um, both of those to kind of help us identify uh, parenting programs that have strong evidence behind them. We say, okay, these are the ones that we really want to look at and say, what are they? Doing? And then from there, we had multiple coders come together and extract the content components from these programs, start writing out definitions. There were meetings where we would come together and start talking about what, you know, uh, what did you find? What did I find? Trying to, you know, get, get to that common ground. Once we had the components out from the programs, we then started doing a data reduction process where we were looking at all of the programs across the board and what, pro what components seem to be shared across multiples of those programs. And then we started to compile that into a final set. And at that point, we would bring in another person who hadn't been involved as kind of a, another test of validity to look at the results and see. And then that process would end up with us getting to a final set of content components that we say, okay, these are the things for this particular program we're developing, for example, Take Root or for example, Sprout. These are the particular content components we really wanna make sure we're emphasizing in the curriculum development um, phase. And so the next slide kind of just gives you an example of a visual example of what that map looks like for us. Um, yep. So this is an example of Take Root and an example from Sprout, sort of a visual mapping. So we would get those components. Once we finalize those components, we would then map them onto our learning domains and then kind of use this as a quick and easy visual map to help us as we move along that content curriculum development process of knowing these are the things we really want to emphasize. These are the areas that they fit into. And it really served as a nice guide as we started working uh, with uh, subject matter experts and other people in that curriculum development process. One other thing I will say uh, before I turn it back over to uh, Terry is, and we do at the end of the presentation have a slide with a couple of different presentations, or sorry, a couple of different publications that we have uh, that have come out from of our Thrive work, one of which does detail the common components analysis we use in program development very thoroughly. Uh, so if that's something that interests you, there is further reading that you can do on that of how we've used that. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Terry. Thanks, Ryan. Okay, so now what we'd like to do is just provide you with a brief description of each of the universal programs. So we're just going to go through each four of these and show you little snippets of some examples of things that are found within the program to give you a better idea of some of the features um, that are within each of the programs. So again, Take Root is our universal parenting program that serves to support parents from pregnancy through three years. Um, of age. And to the right of the screen, you'll see the nine components from the CCA that Ryan was just talking about. Um, so to name a few, we've got positive parent-child interactions, socio-emotional and cognitive development, and child safety. So Take Root actually has three separate program tracks. We have Take Root for zero to six months, for six to 12 months, and for one to three years. So you can go on and take the program that you need for the age that your child is at the time. And then you can build on those as your child ages, develops, and you get to those different stages. Each of those individual age tracks takes about 90 minutes to complete. So on this slide here, we wanna show you the introduction video that the Take Roots zero to six month age track has. And it just gives you an idea of again, what some of the materials look like, some things that you'll find, some of the features, and I'm hoping the audio works. So if it doesn't, please somebody just shout and let me know so I can adjust that. Cute, huh? Yep, that's me. They call me Harry and I'm the cutest. That's what they say. I don't like to brag. Seems like yesterday I could do anything I wanted, any time I wanted. Sleep, eat, barf, play, scream, fart, pee. Don't get me wrong, I didn't know what I was doing back then. Harry! Oops. You know, kids that age, maybe that's why they let me get away with it. Besides, I was so darn cute. That's mom and dad. They're lots of fun. First thing we learned after Harry arrived was that our lives automatically switched to baby time. <laughs> it would take some trial and error before we could begin to agree on a schedule. 
partly regulated by us, but mostly by Harry. Sometimes in my favor? Sometimes in mom and dad's. But it's always been a compromise, a learning experience for all of us. I was so darn cute. See what I mean? Okay, so that's meant to be a fun, engaging video, you know, that welcomes users into the program and kind of sets the stage for what's to come. And I will just share that's actually my child in that video and she never slept ever. So, you know, I, I don't know. For those of us who are parents, you can probably relate to the things that were said um, during that video. Okay, so let me get it to the end. There we go. Okay, so Sprout now is our universal online Thrive program for parents and caregivers of children in that three to five year old age range. And again, to the right of the screen, you're going to see those CCA findings. For example, for this program, um, we have discipline and parenting practice, media and violence, and child and health wellness. So Sprout is set up differently from Take Root. And what it does is it follows four unique families. So we have a father and his sons who live with the grandmother. We have a single mother and her son. We have a traditional family, we have a military family, and we follow each of those families across these different scenarios with everyday moments. So we have moments like morning routine, bedtime routine, dinner time, play date, shopping, um, rainy day. So we have, I think, a total of 24 scenarios for all of those families, all of those different everyday moments. Each of the scenarios takes approximately 10 minutes to complete. On this screen here, you'll see what those scenarios look like. So in this program, we start with the scenario. We take a look at the parent's perspective and the child's perspective. And we do this a lot throughout Thrive because we're really looking to get the parent to realize what their child might be thinking and feeling isn't necessarily the same as what they're thinking and feeling. So we got an idea for what's going on. We talk about age appropriate expectations. We apply a strategy. So we introduce a strategy. Then we apply that and we redo the scenario to see what can it look like now. Um, to the right of the screen, we also have an example of a resource, a downloadable parent toolkit resource that's found within the programming. This particular one is about troubleshooting bedtime challenges. And if your child falls into one of these potential categories, what kinds of things could you do? A lot of these downloadable resources um, you could print them out, you could hang them on your refrigerator, or it's a document for you to fill out and keep or do something with. So we have those throughout all of the programs. Next up, we have GROW. Again, this is our program for parents and caregivers of children in the five to 10 year old age range. GROW actually contains 26 components from the CCA findings. So to the right, you'll see some of those components like skill building or skill encouragement, um, limit setting and monitoring and effective communication. As we mentioned previously, GROW is the only universal program that's available in both the online and face-to-face -face format. So GROW Online actually contains eight interactive sessions and that one takes about four and a half hours for parents to complete. And I don't think I forgot to mention, Sprout actually takes about four hours for somebody to do all of the scenarios. Um, then grow face to face. Um, that is a five week facilitator led parenting program. So that's for groups of 10 to 12 families. And then each session lasts about 90 minutes. We also have available through Thrive online training for the facilitator if someone would like to implement grow in that face to face format and CEU credits are also available. So for GROW, again, here we have another video feature, and this particular clip is talking about strategies to help manage misbehavior by planning ahead. The GROW program is really heavily video-based, so it has a lot of videos that build on top of those strategies to really help engage the user and then to also um, focus on skill practice. So let's see if we can get this one to play. Sometimes you can prevent problem behaviors and avoid having to use discipline simply by planning ahead. For example, a hungry child can make running errands much more challenging, 
By planning ahead and packing a snack, you can reduce the likelihood that the child's drop in blood sugar will result in behavior that slows you down and adds stress to your busy schedule. Making simple changes in a child's environment can also help make parenting easier. When your child was a toddler, you probably put dangerous or breakable items out of reach and also used baby gates to keep them away from unsafe areas. Even though your child is older now, you can still make changes to the environment to protect your child and to prevent problem behaviors. Okay, again, so we just wanted to show you some of the features that are available, some of the ways parents will interact um, with the programming materials. Sometimes. Okay, so then our final program here is branch out again for the 10 to 18 year old range. And you'll see those eight components um, to the right from the CCA. Things like family life management, nutrition, risky behavior prevention. Um, so those are those are a few of the components there. When we began building the branch out program, we realized that communication was such a huge piece for families with children at this age. So what we decided to do was create a core communication module, and then it's followed by four scenario-based modules. And these modules really use different family scenarios and challenges as entry points for kind of that skill building discussion. The branch out program also takes about four hours to complete if you complete the whole program. And one thing that we should probably mention is that since it is online, you can enter the program, you can pause and come back to it at any time. You can pick up right where you left off. So it's not time-based. You don't have a certain amount of time to make it through the entire program. You can really come back whenever. So again, here on the screen, we have some of the um, interactivity that's within the program and then also some of those downloadable parent toolkit resources. We talk about family meetings a lot within this particular program as a way for, for um, families to engage, for parents to get you know, that interactivity with their child, listen to what you know, their thoughts and feelings and make it you know, kind of a relationship that's built on mutual trust and respect. So we have some materials for a family meeting action plan. If you do a family meeting, writing down kind of the do outs from that meeting so everybody knows their expectations. The screenshot right in front is a family media plan. We actually have this within several of the programs where you can go into the program itself and you're filling out your plan. And then at the end, you can download and you can print that plan. So you have it, you can share that with the family. So you're all on the same page with the expectations there. To the right of the screen, one of the nice things that Branch Out does is we look at, you know, talking to the parent who is the is the parent of the victim of certain situations like bullying or cyberbullying or dating violence. But one thing we also do is we speak to the parent who could potentially be the parent of that, that child who is the bully or the child who is the aggressor. So we do the flip side as well so that there's information for both parents because you could very easily be sitting on either sides of those spectrums. So we offer resources for both. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit here and talk about our supplemental programs we have um, as a result of some feedback received from the field and conversations we had with our partners. Um, we started to develop these supplemental parent education modules. So they're all online and they focus on identified topics to offer some additional supports to families. They're really intended to be additions to age appropriate universal programming like the Thrive programs or like SFP 10 to 14. And each supplemental module is about two hours in length. We currently have two supplemental modules available online. We have Exceptional Families Embracing Differences Flourishing Together, and that is for families with a child with a disability. And then we have Grand Families Prospering with 10 to 14 year olds. Um, and as Janet mentioned earlier, that's for grandparents who are the primary caregivers of an adolescent um, in that 10 to 14 year old age range. We will actually be completing six additional supplemental modules over the next year on topics like mental health. That one will actually be coming in July. We have parental absence, co-parenting, sibling relationships, technology, and harmful behaviors in youth and children. And really the motivation behind this is to go kind of a step beyond that universal program and talk about specific issues or challenges that families are experiencing and what additional supports can we give them? What additional information can we provide to them 
them in this universal realm. So I would be a parent, I would go on and say, take branch out. And then I'd be like, hey, this looks like something that would be useful to me too. I'm gonna go ahead and take that grand families module, or I can also take the exceptional family module. So you can take whatever you would like to take. So speaking more specifically, about the grand family's supplemental module. This was really developed to meet the needs of PROSPER and to, and to provide that extra um, parent education to grandparents who may now be assuming this primary caregiver role. So the goals of this particular program are to help grandparents develop um, you know, a positive caretaking relationship with their grandchild and to really understand how to communicate and support their grandchild while they also continue to meet their own needs and manage their own stress and their health. We try to achieve these goals in the program um, by, by separating it into four parts. So part one is cultivating the relationship with your grandchild. So in this particular part, we talk about the developmental needs and expectations and parenting techniques and styles. It may be a long time since some of these individuals have actually parented a child. And so what's different now, you know, what's acceptable now, those types of things. Part two is communication. So we talk about different um, communication approaches. We talk about how to be mindful when you're communicating with a child who has experienced trauma or when you're communicating with a child about their absent parent and how to speak specifically to those things. In part three, um, identifying supports for you and your grandchild, we talk about negotiating systems of care and how you can get the help that you need for yourself, but also for your grandchild. And then in part four, we talk about caring for yourself. So we're talking about coping and growing with grief and loss. And that could be, you know, the loss of your adult child or the relationship you once had with them or of the life that you thought maybe you'd be living at this time point, right? Or potentially now serving in the parent role and no longer getting to just be the grandparent. And then also how to manage stress and build in time for yourself. Um, the process that we actually use to develop these supplemental modules is we start with um, first identifying a subject matter expert. So we identify the expert and we work closely with them to develop the content. And then we also develop those downloadable parent toolkit resources that we showed you for some of the other programs. We then work alongside our learning design team to adapt these programs for the online delivery. And then we get that content placed into the online learning management system. And then of course we have to maintain that online platform. Okay, so this is a snapshot here of, of the Thrive website. And if we have time at the end, we can actually go into the website and kind of poke around and show you what that looks like. But along with the other Thrive programming, the Grand Family Supplemental Module can be accessed directly through the Thrive website. So it's very easy. You go on to the website, you identify the program that you want to take, and then you click on a nice big blue button that says register here um, to sign up. And then you do the registration or the sign up for the learning management system. It just asks for your name, your email, and you get granted um, access directly into the program. You don't have to wait for an email to come and then you're granted access. You can immediately enter in. And then once you're in there, you'll see on the right of the screen, we have the course catalog. So all of the programs that are currently available through Thrive are here. So you can pick and choose which module you would like to take. So you'll see the grand families module there at the bottom of the screen. So now we wanted to show you an example of an interactive activity that is within the grandparent module. In this particular activity, the user will kind of navigate through this scenario. And this scenario is a grandfather, Francis, who starts to have a conversation with his granddaughter, Caitlin, about finding a vape pen among her things. And this is really Concerning to him because Francis's daughter, Caitlin's mother, is currently in a drug rehab facility. So it's very concerning. It pulls up a lot of emotions for him. So we show um, the communication that happens. And, you know, Francis is, is, he's really concerned. He's coming at Caitlin like this is completely unacceptable. And she's coming back. It's not a big deal, you know everybody has these things and he's like this is a huge deal i don't want you to turn into your mother and of course it escalates and the child's like i'm not my mother you know i'm not her type things 
So then we take a look at the two perspectives, right? So we look at Caitlin, you know, what is she thinking and feeling? She's like, I just want to fit in. You know, all my friends are doing this. They're not addicts. Why does grandpa think I'm, I'm just like my mother? I'm not her. And then we have Francis and his side, you know, and he's like, I'm worried about her. Um, I just want her to be healthy and safe. And how can I show her that I want the best for her? So then we bring in that strategy. And in this particular case, we have active listening. So we talk about active listening. We talk about how to apply that. And then we show the redo. So the user is kind of following through this whole process. And then we get back and we do it again. So let's do it again. Let's do it with active listening. And this time, you know, grandpa is saying, hey, we need to talk about something. Can you please come sit down? You know, I found this thing, talk to me about it. And he he holds back, he gives her space to be able to share and doesn't just come at her. And then we have him saying, you know, I it sounds like you're doing this. Yeah, it sounds like you're feeling this. So we hear those him incorporating those strategies into there. And he has a much better interaction or communication pattern with Caitlin um, about this. So she reacts better to the way he approaches it. And in the end is more successful with what he's trying to do in the end. So we have activities like that throughout the program for the user to in, engage with. So shifting gears again, just a little bit here, in addition to the universal programming that we have available online for parents and caregivers, we also have a lot of resources available for professionals. So to the left of the screen, you'll see our Thrive Professional Resource, which is our one of our latest resources that we have. And this is really a packet of handouts for professionals if they're working with a family and there's an issue they can grab that resource they can provide it to the family and then they're directed some of to some of the additional resources like the thrive online bottom we have that available across all ages we have it for the specific age group so very specific very nice resources to be able to hand to a family we also have all of the handouts for all of the specific thrive programs that can be delivered to families or used in whatever ways um, seem appropriate. And we have a digital empowerment resource. This resource is specifically designed for teachers, for youth um, care center workers. Um, and they, this packet is huge. I wanna say it's almost 300 pages long. There are a lot of activities within this particular resource that a teacher can use if they want to highlight some of these things and how to talk about digital engagement and how to do things appropriately, like social media, like your digital footprint, those types of things. Again, we have it separated into ages so that it's age appropriate that is available to go on and download and use. And then the final resource that we have are these hybrid implementation facilitation manuals. So these are manuals for a facilitator to use if they want to implement the online programming programs with a face to face component. So it's set up to tell you how to you can go through the program in say a five week process, six week process, and you're having the families engage online. And then you're meeting once a week with them to talk about, you know, kind of what you learned, what does this look like? The manuals include a parent workbook for the parent to follow along. And the development of those really came out of some feedback that we got through individuals taking um, the programming saying, hey, you know, this is great, but I'm missing a little bit of that kind of face-to-face -face interaction. I wanna know I'm not alone. I wanna see that other parents are having these struggles too. So we ended up developing those. We have those currently available for Take Root, Sprout and Grow, and we are working on the manual for Branch Out right now. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Ryan at this point so he can talk to you a little bit about the research that we've conducted thus far on Thrive. Thank you, Terry. Um, so since the start of the Thrive Initiative, we have been hard at work trying to build the evidence base uh, for our programming. Um, uh, but as uh, I'm sure many, uh, if not all of you are aware, uh, that is a long process uh, that requires a significant amount of uh, resources and time. Um, and so just wanted to share with you some of our preliminary work that we have done to try to lay the base or the foundation uh, to move us towards a greater evidence base. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, 
our face-to-face -face grow program was really where we started uh, with the whole development of Thrive. And so this is where the research also started. Um, we did a civilian pilot study uh, in two Pennsylvania communities. Um, and this was done in the spring of 2015 uh, is when we did this. And a um, couple things just up here on the screen to highlight. A uh, few demographics are placed up there. You can kind of see that this is sort of a, a homogenous sample of individuals. So we're, we're, not, uh, we're not looking at great diversity, but um, this just gives you kind of a sense of who our sample was. Um, our design, it was a non-experimental pre-post design. Uh, and our goal was really just to look at implementation feasibility and to kind of get some initial establishment of proof of concept. So um, we were asking questions like, uh, can we actually train facilitators to uh, lead the, these in-person groups? Can we actually get people to come to these in-person groups? Um, will people like what we, uh, will they like the programming content? Will they find it useful? Will they engage with it? Um, is there any movement that we might see on outcomes of interest uh, related to parenting or maybe to child uh, functioning? And so uh, we did that. We did that study. Um, we did find some favorable program implementation findings. We did find that people were really satisfied with the program. Those who were participating in it were satisfied. Um, we found that uh, they were engaging with the materials and they did find it to be uh, useful information, useful things, uh, strategies and skills for them to be able to incorporate into their uh, parenting routines. Um, we had, uh, here we, go. we recruited 36 individuals for that uh, study. We got 26 of them to complete a, pro, a pre test. We got uh, 20 of them to uh, attend three or more sessions and to also complete a post test. So um, we had, as you can see here on the screen, we had, we had some program attrition and we had some study attrition um, that uh, was going on there that we needed to think through how do we get greater retention rates. Um, but in the process, we did find some significant pre-post differences on a number of parent and child outcomes. So we found parenting Parents reported decreased stress. They reported increased efficacy. Uh, they reported that their children, uh, their child's outdoor playtime increased, uh, that internalizing behavior decreased. So we, we found some generally overall favorable and positive results from this feasibility study. Um, and that kind of launched us into trying to do this with the military. Um, and so in the summer of 2016 and the spring of 2017, we conducted a very similar non-experimental pre-post design study, uh, implemented at four military installations, two of which were in the US and two of which were abroad, one in Italy and one in Germany. Um, that was an interesting experience, uh, trying to work with um, some of the challenges that we were not anticipating coming from uh, what military culture looks like when you're stationed abroad. Um, but again, just looking at some demographics there, we see fairly similar to our civilian pilot. Again, very homogenous group of individuals uh, looking at the same sort of implementation things, engagement, uh, feasibility, satisfaction, uh, fidelity, curriculum fidelity. Um, and again, we found very uh, comparable results to the civilian study. Uh, those who were coming were satisfied and were engaging with the materials, the facilitators, uh, in the military pilot, just like in the civilian pilot, uh, had very high fidelity rating scores. They were sticking with the curriculum and implementing it as it was intended and designed to be implemented. And so we were getting some initial positive feedback that, yeah, we, we, there's, there's a hope that we can really be implementing these face-to-face -face programs um, in a military setting. Uh, but similarly, we we got some attrition rates, higher attrition rates uh, from the program and both the study. Uh, just to give you a quick snapshot, we recruited 70 military families. Um, we had 45 people uh, of that 70. We actually had 45 people complete a pretest. Uh, 33 attended uh, more than half of the program and 27 completed a post test. So we did encounter some greater challenges with getting study participation um, 
from, from these individuals. And I think some of that was due to um, barriers that we just didn't anticipate in working with the military culture. I kind of alluded to the fact that um, working with uh, bases um, sort of outside of the US, it's a, it's a different situation. So I'll give you one example, just to kind of help you understand what I mean by some of the barriers we encountered that we did not anticipate. Uh, one example was um, Grow is kind of uh, really centered on, as it's a face-to-face -face program, we were really encouraging facilitators, you know, try to do fun things like raffles and just different things like that to kind of keep people engaged and coming to the programs. Um, that proved to be almost impossible. There was a great deal of red tape surrounding facilitators on base ability to do raffles or provide meals. They actually couldn't provide meals. Um, that was something that they just couldn't do. Um, childcare also proved to be a challenge, getting them to provide childcare. Um, some bases were able to get through that approval process, others weren't. But even with the bases that got through that approval process, there were challenges. The base in Germany, um, they had their childcare set up 45 minutes away from where they had the program sessions happening at. So that was one of those like, oh, okay, um, that's probably not going to be super helpful to parents. Uh, and so I think a lot of those factors perhaps contributed to some of the study and program attrition rates that we saw and, and you know, some other things as well. Um, but again, for those who were coming, for those we managed to get to come and plugged into the program, they were satisfied, they were engaged, they found the material useful and appropriate for them at their stage of parenting. Um, and we did also, again, we found some uh, preliminary evidence suggesting that we might, that, you know, GROW might be able to move the needle a little bit on some parenting and child outcomes. Uh, for example, we saw decreases in child externalizing and internalizing behavior, decreases in parenting stress, decreases in parents' inconsistent discipline. Um, we saw decreases in parents' use of food as a reward. Uh, it's kind of another health promotion outcome we were looking at. So again, some positive results came of this. Um, but then we began to shift gears to our online program and specifically shifting GROW to an online format as one of the first transitions into the online realm um, that we did for the many reasons that Terry discussed earlier. Um, and we conducted a study of that as well. And uh, this study actually took place in the summer of 2017. And um, again, you can see a very homogenous sample that looks very similar to our previous samples. Um, we really thought that moving into an online um, environment was going to really help with some of the barrier reduction and attrition rates that we were seeing. Um, but we actually found with our Grow Online study that we had the highest attrition rate of any of the studies that we had conducted so far. Um, but we also had the highest and easiest recruitment that we'd ever gotten either. So in less than, I think it was a period of three weeks, we recruited 83 individuals uh, to participate in this study. Um, but the numbers began to trail off after that. We got 59 of those people to do a pretest. Um, 25 of them completed more than half of the program and uh, 22 completed a post-test. Um, one of the things I think we really learned from this is that even with online programming, summer is a terrible time to try to do any sort of program implementation. People just will not engage over the summer months. Uh, even if they're able to do it at their own pace, on their own time, people have good intentions, but things get crazy. Summer is hard, a hard time, a dysregulated time of schedule changes and things of that nature. Military families have it a little bit different though than civilian families, because this is also the time and it's called the PCS season or permanent change of station. So this is the time of year that military families, many military families are transitioning from one base to another base as the active duty service member is starting a new um, position or, uh, or, or a duty that they have at this new installation. So um, that I think contributed a lot to some of the attrition rates that we're seeing here. But again, we found that for people that we could actually get to engage with the program, uh, very favorable implementation outcomes. They were very engaged with the programming itself, very satisfied, uh, found it to be uh, very useful uh, for them and what they were learning and able to apply it into their daily lives um, as parents. And we also noted, again, some significant pre-post differences, moving the needle perhaps on 
uh, various parent and child outcomes. Again, we found overreactive and inconsistent discipline practices decreased. Uh, child externalizing and internalizing, we saw decreases in that. The parenting efficacy increased. Um, parents' reports of emotion coaching, helping their children identify and move through emotion, difficult emotions. We saw change in that in a positive direction as well. So again, some very encouraging results from this, leading us to believe if we could conduct more rigorous evaluations, we might really uh, be able to see grow doing some real positive things. And then lastly, we, we moved into uh, our Take Root and our Sprout program. Um, and so with Take Root, uh, for both of these, uh, Sprout is currently ongoing, uh, but for Take Root uh, and for Sprout, we uh, received some internal funding from the SSRI. We did a, a, some internal seed funding from SSRI to help us kind of conduct some preliminary evaluations of these programs. And uh, we, we were able to partner with the Armed Services YMCA. So the Armed Services YMCA is a branch of the, tip of the normal YMCA that specifically focuses on serving military populations. Um, and so we were able to partner with them uh, to be able to recruit from and get uh, participants um, for our study uh, to participate in this. And uh, again, you can kind of see demographically a very homogenous sample, very similar uh, to our previous studies. Um, you'll notice that attrition rates uh, look a lot different in this. They're actually much lower uh, and kind of where um, obviously the lower attrition is always better, but this is a little bit more, uh, I think, uh, manageable. Um, and I think I would attribute this uh, to a variety of things, one of which is um, uh, we had funding to pay people to participate in research. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think um, when people are operating under good intentions, that's that can be helpful for them. But in terms of participating in research, um, compensating them for their time, I think is a valuable thing that we can do. And I think that really paid off here in this. Uh, again, favorable implementation outcomes, people who were engaged with the programming were satisfied. In fact, um, for this particular study, we uh, recruited 79 folks. We got 65 of them to complete a pretest. Um, 57 of them started the program and 55 of those people completed all sessions. And we had 63 people complete a post-test. So one of the things we take away from that is that 96% of people who started the program finished it, um, which was a really encouraging finding for us. Uh, and we did find some significant pre-post differences on parenting efficacy, mindful relaxation and family functioning. So again, very positive results there. And we're actually currently in the process of trying to get external funding uh, to take this take root evaluation um, to a higher level, doing a randomized, larger scale randomized controlled trial, um, looking at um, sort of the implementation and program efficacy of take root. And with Sprout Online, like I said, it's currently in progress. We are also working with the ASYMCA on that, although we are finding recruitment challenges and things that are happening there that are a little more, um, a little more difficult than we experienced with Take Root. Um, but we actually are trying to conduct a pilot randomized controlled trial with that one. So we're, we're actually trying to incorporate an even more rigorous design from the beginning uh, with this uh, in, in hopes that that will help us as we go to secure external funding to move these things to a higher evidence base. Um, so that's kind of an overview of our um, research that, we're, that we've conducted so far. Uh, like I said, it's a long process and uh, there's still a lot of work, and a lot of hard work that we're in the process of doing to move us forward. One final thing I will say about this because I did forget to mention it with Grow Online one thing we did find, because it was interesting with the attrition rate, one thing that we did find is that it, for people who completed the program, for people who completed Grow Online, they started the program, they started the first session within one week of the study starting. And for people who didn't complete the program, they took almost three times as long to start the first session. And so I think that potentially indicates that with online programming, one of the big things that you may want to focus on and think about to get people engaged with online programming is there's a critical window possibly. And you really want to get people engaged with online programming as quickly as you possibly can, because it seems like that might help them really engage and stick with the whole thing, as opposed to 
a, a, a long drawn out process of when things start and when they actually start engaging with the program. So we thought through things like reminder messages um, and um, different strategies we could build into the LMS to kind of make it more engaging and make it kind of more um, um, motivating to start things early. Um, so those are all things that lessons learned that we're continuing to work through and incorporate. I think the final slide I have uh, just kind of is that publication slide that I mentioned earlier, where we we've, we've published a couple of different things have come out of our Thrive initiative. Um, and these are things that uh, if you're so inclined, you can um, find them online uh, and read them and learn a little bit more about the work that we're doing and kind of the directions that we're hoping to go in the future. And I think with that, we uh, have maybe a little bit of time opened and left for questions. Okay, thanks, Ryan. <clears throat> so um, just before we hop into questions, and we definitely would like, like to hear from everyone, um, I, I, I think, you know, uh, the Clearinghouse folks have done a good job of identifying two, uh, two themes that I think are worth noticing. One is that many in the practitioner world had to switch to online delivery of interventions, right? And there's a lot of that still going on. We don't know a lot about it, what makes it work, what doesn't work very well. We have some, you know, anecdotal and, and field-based experiences around that. But but the Clearinghouse has really been working on this issue and unpacking it. And so some of their work with Thrive could probably help those of you in other areas who are who are struggling with this remote delivery of interventions. So that's one thing. The other thing I want to say before we hop into questions is that, um, you know, possibly some of you um, were glazing over a little bit when, when Ryan was going through the research, but as you remember, um, that's very important to us in Prosper, right? We, we want things to be evidence-based. We want things to be based in research and to have some confidence in what we're doing. Um, Thrive certainly does not have the current evidence base that our other more traditional interventions have, but it's emerging. And we uh, wanted you to know that these resources are broadly available to anyone who might want to use them. And with that, we'll just sort of open it up for questions. Comments. I think this is Terry, and I think one thing I want to say that we didn't mention is, you know, in talking about this online shift and during the pandemic, we actually had organizations that reached out to us when the pandemic started who offered face to face programming. And since they couldn't get the parents in for the programming, they did this shift with Thrive and had the parents take the online Thrive programs because then the families could continue to get points and things that they needed in order to buy diapers or buy formula and stuff like that. So because we had that available and the military offers that at no cost to everyone, they were able to really quickly make the shift to the online programming and their families didn't lose any of those needed items. Um, they were able to purchase them with their points by using the online. There are certificates that parents get at the end when they complete a program. So they were able to just show their certificate of completion and get their items. Any questions, comments? Um, I just have a comment. Uh, first of all, I think this is a wonderful program. I did not know it existed before you started sharing about it. So thank you for telling us about it. But one of the things that you said really um, made me think, okay, in my work as a mentor with seventh and eighth grade students, I will incorporate this with whatever I can do with their parents and grandparents. You said being the grandparent changes as they now become a parent. And I was thinking about that. And how do you balance that role? Because a grandparent is a very different relationship than a parent, especially as they get older and they move into these later programs beyond sport and they have to uh, find ways to communicate and possibly um, show their, their grandchildren what the boundaries are um, and what's permissible and what's not. So I really appreciated that because that is giving me ideas and I will definitely check out those online resources. So thank you for the information. 